Hi, my name's Bob Wormsley and I'm the technical trainer at Insidium, the makers of X-Particles and Cycles 4D. And in this tutorial, we're going to be taking our water helix mesh that we created in part one and we'll be rendering it in Cycles 4D. Here's how it looked in the X-Particles reel. So we're going to create a custom material in Cycles 4D and we're going to reference some of that particle colour data that we burnt into our particle simulation. We'll then set up some scene lighting and we'll get a camera with some shallow depth of field and then we'll look through some render settings to ensure we've got good quality and a fast render but without any unwanted noise. So we've got lots to fit in, let's get started. So here's our water helix scene from scene one and we've built this scene in X-Particles and you can see that we have our helix water mesh. This was created um, by using this particle emitter to emit these particles. They're coloured blue to white, blue being the slower particles, white being the faster particles. And we'll use that colour data in the render. These particles have been advected by this exposure FX simulation, which is a smoke and fire simulation, which is being forced around this helix object using our flow field object. Um, so we've got this nice cache of these particles which are moving in a very kind of fluid organic like way and that's what explosion effects gave us but they're also following the path of this helix spline uh, which is very nice giving this illusion of a water helix so that is our simulation we've cached it out which means that i can deactivate these two dynamic objects which means it's going to run quite quickly in the viewport and then we've got our open vdb mesher activated here so that gives us the mesh. So what we're going to do is move on to rendering this with Cycles 4D. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, make the particles invisible just for the time being. So we're just looking at our mesh and there we go. So what we need to do, first of all, I'm just going to swap uh, my layout for a more kind of Cycles 4D friendly layout. So I'm just going to go to my Cycles layout. And this is slightly different. You can see I've got a very small viewport down here, but it is a normal viewport all the same. Um, the attribute manager with all of the settings for my object is here in the normal position. My object manager obviously is exactly the same. It's just moved into a different position to this part of the, um, of the screen. And then here I've got my interactive render region. And here I've got my material editing node work area so that's what we're going to do so if i hit play on my real-time preview there isn't anything in the viewport and that is because um, there are no lights in the scene so let's just to get an idea of what this mesh is and what we've got let's bring in a cycles 4d environment so we're going to use this to initially light the scene let's just bring that size down to 50 percent and there we go so here is our mesh being lit by this environment object and you can see that when we kind of light it and render it even in this kind of clay material it's looking quite nice so let's have a look at this background object um, when we bring in an environment it automatically has a background uh, material applied to it and these are the nodes in that background material this is the normal output node with a, a surface input and then we've just got one background texture so what I can do is let's just put uh, an HDRI image into here so we can light this using um, using that color and light information. So what we'll do to do that is get a texture, environment texture, and I'm just going to put, input the color of that into the color of the background. And then with this, what I need to do, if I highlight the node, here's my attributes here for this node. And I need to put a texture into this texture window. Um, it's gone this uh, magenta color because it can't find an image texture which is which is it's looking for. So it, it goes this by default. So what I'm going to do is go to my content browser and I've got the I've just searched for HDRs in the Cinema 4D free material and there's all these different HDRs um, and anything will do. So let's just what's this one here? Let's drag in this one which is of a the roof of a, a car parking garage so i'll drop that into there and go back to my node editor now to get this to work you have to uncheck load from disk uh, for anything from the content browser and then if we load that in again 
it's going to load our HDR. Let's just reduce these samples a wee bit. Okay, so now we're having this lit by this HDR and it's looking really nice as a mesh. Obviously, it doesn't look like water, but as a mesh, it looks pretty decent. So we'll begin by uh, making our water texture. So let's go to create in our material editor uh, browser down here and we'll go to cycles 4D surface and there's a glass node. So we'll take the glass node and I'm going to drag that onto my water helix. And it'll take just a couple of seconds to update. And there we've got the start of our glass material. And just dolly in a little bit. There we go. And we've got this glass texture. Now you can see at the moment that we've got some areas which are kind of transparent. But then we've got these very heavily dark areas as well. It doesn't look very good. And that's because we haven't got enough effectively kind of ray bounces to lighten up this area. So what we need to do to adjust that is go to our project render settings. So I've got my render settings docked here, but you can get to your render settings, settings by hitting this button. So what we'll do is in the renderer, we'll select cycles 4D, which brings up a new menu here. These are the general render settings. Let's just make this space a bit bigger. So I'm just going to put this on to CUDA. And what I want to do is come down to the light paths and ray depth section of this. Um, because we've got a fair few settings here, um, some of which are going to be useful to us. We have a transparency depth of 8 um, and a transmission depth of 12. And these are the two um, areas that are going to be important to get realistic um, transparency and reflections. Um, but the problem is we're not getting all eight steps in either the transparency or the 12 in the transmission. And that is because the max ray bounces is kind of like a global control. So if this is set to one, you're only going to get one transparency depth, one glossy depth, one volume depth, and one transmission depth and diffuse as well. Um, and so it, it doesn't work for us. To see the effects of these eight transmission depths, we have to bring up this global amount. So let's just bring it up to two. So keep an eye on the, um, the real-time preview here. And I'm going to increase this by one. And let's hit play. We weren't playing. And you see it's lightened up because the reflections are able to have had one more bounce now. So we're, we're filling in some of these darker areas. Let's give it another and another. And so the more we increase these, the closer we're getting to this transparency and transmission depth. Um, so that's much better. And already this looks obviously far more transparent and it's kind of working. Now, what I'd say was using an HDR to light this and to use that for the reflections is, is quite effective. And, and very quickly, this looks like a water splash, doesn't it? And it's it's incorporating this HDR fantastically. Uh, and we're seeing the, reflection, the reflections and whatnot. The problem with this technique is if you're not going to be actually using this HDR image in your final background of your render, it's not going to look as good. It's going to look a little bit odd. You, you kind of need, it's all relative and you need to be able to see this in the background for your brain to make sense of the reflections being this color. So let's demonstrate that. If I go to my environment object here in the object manager and uh, make it invisible to the camera. So the HDR is going to be visible to everything apart from the camera. All of a sudden, now we have a black background these reflections don't seem right. And actually, it doesn't even look transparent anymore. It looks like a reflective metal surface. And these are all tricks of the eye. So you need the context of the background for it to feel like it's transparent. Otherwise, it starts to look too reflective and look like metal. So I don't want... This is a quite a low-res HDR, and it's not a particularly nice one. It's just of a car park. So I don't want this in the final render. So lighting it using this and using this for the reflections isn't going to be a good idea. So let's just get... Well, I'll leave it in there for now just because it's providing some light. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use an object to light this, um, which will appear in the, the reflections and the refraction. Um, so 
the object is going to have um, a texture. And a really good object to use, which gives you a very good look very quickly if you're wanting to use very dark or even um, completely matte black backgrounds, is using a torus. So if we bring in a torus into our scene, there it is, and you can see it in the real-time preview. And what I'm going to do is make it a bit bigger. And I'm going to lift it up a bit. And I'm just going to angle it slightly, kind of like this. Now, I think I'll make it slightly bigger. So I don't want this torus to be visible in uh, the real-time preview and the render, obviously. But I want it to light the scene. So what we need to do is use the equivalent of a compositing tag to say, look, use this torus to light everything, but don't be seen by the camera. So the way we do that in Cycles is we have it highlighted and we go to the tags and we go to... Oh, sorry... Cycles 4D tags, and just off your screen, I have got an object tag. There we go. So in the object tag, I've got these kind of compositing settings. So if I say, don't be seen by camera, it's still there. You'll see it in the reflections, but it's not being seen uh, by the camera, which is great. So before I switch off the environment and use this Taurus to light the scene, Obviously, we need the torus to have a light texture on it. Otherwise, it's not going to be emitting any light and it's not going to be doing anything. It's going to be useless. So let's go to Create in the Material Manager here and go to Cycles, Surface, Emission. And the Emission texture, we'll put that on the torus. Let's just go to my Node Editor. And in the Emission texture, let's put it at Full White and I'll just leave it at that strength for now. So now what I'm going to do is just delete, get rid of my environment. So delete that. So now the only thing that is lighting this is the torus. And what is being seen in the water are the reflections of that torus. And that now on the black background is still looking pretty nice, even though we don't have that... Um, mental kind of contextualization of seeing what's in the background um, that's affecting these um, these splashes. So that's looking pretty nice. I think that's okay. So we could make some adjustments to that torus. For example, let's just uh, make the pipe radius a bit so it's a bit thinner. And so, so we're having a, a much narrower reflective band. If we make it super, super thin, it's having much less impact and then we could perhaps increase the strength of the material to then bring some of that brightness back. So there's there's various different ways in which we can adjust this, but I'm going to just put that back up a bit, that radius, because I think it was actually by default not looking too bad. All right, so I'll, I'll just keep it like that for now. Um, we may make some adjustments later on when we look at this in a, a slightly uh, larger context. Right, so... I'm just going to move across my material editor and increase my render area just so we can see this a little bit more clearly. So increase that size. All right, that's better. Maybe even slightly more, 80. Okay, so here is our water. So what else do we want to do? Well, we've got our basic water material, which is just a glass node. And one thing that's incorrect here is that the index of refraction by default on the glass node is 1.45. And this isn't a correct index of refraction for water. Water is 1.33. So let's change that to 1.33. And it'll just change slightly uh, the way in which uh, light is uh, refracted um, in that uh, material. So that's one element. But we can do something else here. Now, obviously, we've got a colour slider within this node. So if I bring up my colour options, if I wanted to, I could bring some colour into this. So there's some, some red water or some blue water. The problem with that, let's just say we wanted to have a very a subtle touch of blue in. But there's a uniform blueness throughout the whole um, material here, which may be fine, but it's not particularly, it doesn't particularly feel that realistic. So let's say we want to colour this with more of a variation in that colour. Well, what we're able to do is use our OpenVDB mesher. 
So at the time of recording, uh, this open VDB measure um, feature is only available in the X particles early access build. So if you look into your open VDB measure, let's move this up. We have this option called transfer point color. So if this isn't available in your open VDB measure, if this, uh, this function here doesn't exist, then this isn't available to you. Um, you haven't got the early access build. Uh, if that's the case, I would just either uh, color your glass, um, your glass shader using this color input here, um, or just or leave it leave it a white color. Uh, but if you do have the early access build, or this is um, uh, available in your um, version of X particles, then this is what we're going to use. So what this does is, um, if I just let's just go back. I'm going to go back to my normal view. Here's our normal view. And let's go to our um, open VDB mesher. So we have this function called transfer point color. If I check that, what happens is that this color vertex map appears on our open VDB mesher. And if I click on that, you can see that the particle color, that blue to white gradient, has been applied to our mesh. which is very good because what we can do is access that in cycles 4d so what i'm going to do is at the moment um the transitions between these colors are, are a little harsh you can see there's blockiness well we can smooth that out if we go to the open vdb measure and we go to the point color map smoothing iterations let's just try it on seven maybe um, that's going to update and now as you see we've smoothed out those areas so that's going to look much better in the render and so that value of seven is going to be fine okay great so we've done that we can leave it now i'm going to go back to my cycles 4d layout and now we have this color vertex tag so this is the key which is uh, it's just fantastic if i take this color vertex tag and drag it into my material editor it creates an attribute point color node. And if I pipe this into the color of my glass, we are now getting that blue and white gradient value put into the glass object, which is excellent. Now, obviously at the moment, it's way too, um, it's way too blue. It, it looks frankly ridiculous. It looks awful, but it's great that we can access that particle information, apply it to the vertices of the open VDB mesher, and then get access to it in Cycles 4D. So let's make this look um, more desirable. So all we need to do really is reduce the saturation of, of this color. And that's really easy to do. We'll just right click and we'll get a color node and we'll get a um, hue saturation value node. Okay, let's just plug it in. And let's just reduce the saturation of that blue. So it's just a touch. All right. And I think, let's just uh, dolly in a bit. I think it's a little bit too blue. And I think this, is, this isn't quite right. I want a much lighter blue. Um, so more of a cyan. So all I can do is just do a hue shift. Let's see. Let's just bring it back there okay so i'm much more liking that one so this is really cool so we have got um this glass material colored now dependent on the it's the speed value of those particles as they're moving through the mesh so the faster particles the faster areas of the mesh are going to be white and the slower areas of the mesh are going to be um going to be this blue color so i think that is very very cool and i like it a lot it's going to make this look fantastic right so that's great that's the attribute uh, point color node so you can drag maps in from your objects it directly into the material editor and then use those in your shaders to um, get the effects that you uh, that you desire so pretty cool right so what else do we need to do here? So we've got our lighting using our torus. We've got our very easy, quick water material made. 
what we need to do really is set up a camera and um, start setting up maybe some um, uh, shallow depth of field and, and getting all that right. So I think what I might do is I'm just going to jump into my standard layout. So what we're going to do is bring a camera in the scene. So we'll go to the Cycles 4D menu and go to the camera. And this brings in a Cinema 4D camera with a Cycles 4D tag on it. So let's look through that camera and let's think about positioning. So I like the... Let's have a look. I really like this underneath section here. Um, I like the way this is coming away from the camera at this point underneath and then whizzing round. So that looks really nice. So I want that in the shot. And I want where it ends, I want this to be out of frame because it'll look odd otherwise if, it, if it's just stopping at a point. So I want that to be out of frame. So it's just dolly in. But what would be nice is if we could get some of this circular shape here. So if, if we could have the angle from maybe here looking upwards. So let's just dolly in from there. So that's looking pretty interesting. Um, not quite right yet, but interesting. So what I'm going to do to make some fine adjustments from here is go to the camera and I'm going to select a null. Make the camera a child of the null, and I'm going to make some adjustments using the null's um, rotation settings. So we've got heading, pitch, and bank. Um, the pitch is going to allow us to maneuver it this way. The heading is going to allow us to kind of twist it. And then the bank is going to give us this more horizontal movement. So I quite like it maybe coming across the frame like this. That's interesting. So let's, I'm just going to deactivate the open VDB mesher. And just so we're looking at the particles, because this almost plays in real time. So this looks quite nice. We've got it coming across the frame, whooshing around in a circle, and then coming back out of frame. So that looks that looks pretty nice. What would be good is if we could just get a little bit of this circular motion in. So let's just see what can I do with this to get it there. We want this to look like it's going away and coming back around again. So something like that is looking quite nice. Um, I could try. We've got a thirty-five mil camera at the moment. We could try a, maybe a slightly wider. Uh, angle lens on that camera and that is going to accentuate that somewhat I think it'll bring it into the um, into the frame more that we want this circular shape coming around that's nice and then we want this coming out of shot so I think we're kind of getting there um, let's go back into my null that out of shot that and then let's just get the camera and just position it here somewhat there we go and i could obviously spend more time finessing this and you uh, we can you can do it uh, however you like but i quite like this coming in whooshing around making this circle and then going out of frame i think that's looking pretty decent um so when you're doing this on your own scene obviously spend ages and you may even have you know a, a director you might have a client that wants a specific shot in mind but we have the luxury in this tutorial to actually just get what looks nice to us so let's just activate our open vdb mesher to get our idea of what this is going to look like when it's actually meshed and i'm just going to deactivate the visibility of those particles so uh, they're not going to get in the way of this and let's move back frame so that's looking pretty good i think and we're going to get we're getting some real dynamism in the shot here as it's whooshing past the camera okay so that's looking all right so let's go back to my cycles 4d layout now that i've got this camera angle that I'm happy with and let's hit render all right so this is looking really nice we've got some really good movement here so the last thing we're going to do with this camera is we want to set up some um, depth of field effects and we want some shallower depth of field so I'm just going to make this interactive render 
region bigger. And let's put that up to, say, 80%. We'll probably fill it. Right, so let's look at depth of field. So what we need to do with depth of field is select our camera and go to the object tab of our camera. And if we just scroll down the object tab, there is a focus distance setting, which by default is put at 2000 centimeters. So if I click this with this picker, I can pick anywhere on my mesh in the viewport and it'll put it into focus. So let's try putting, I don't know, this section in focus. You're not going to see anything. You can see, look, the focus distance has changed, but you're not going to see anything in the viewport because there isn't any depth of field actually uh, attached. We haven't changed the aperture in any way. So what we need to do is go to the camera, to the Cycles 4D camera tag, and we have um, the, this is the motion blur setting. So if we just scroll up slightly to the top of those settings, we have uh, depth of field, radius, and size. So if I just increase the size this bit has immediately been blurred out can you see and this section is in focus a bit more okay so now we have got this uh, bit of blurred out water to begin with comes around gets into focus as it washes up here and then goes out of focus as it makes its way around and washes around this section obviously you can pick whichever area you want we'll go back to the camera and back to the focus distance picker and we could pick this bit in the distance so now this section is in focus around here and this four section is going out of, of focus so obviously it's in in fact that looks quite nice it's entirely up to you and you you can even animate this value should you wish um to get whichever part in focus you desire so that looks pretty nice as well i mean all of these effects are, are going to work well it just depends on which uh, what's the look that you want so i think let's go a bit further back I think I quite like this effect of it coming out of focus right in the foreground and then coming back into focus as it makes its way around here. So I'll just make it slightly closer to us. Yeah, that's looking pretty nice. All right. So the last thing we need to do is make some adjustments to our render settings because if, I don't know if you can notice, but now we've put these depth of field, uh, the shallow depth of field in, we've got some noise coming into this part of the render. Um, and this is going to be uh, a problem at render time. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to just try, I'm going to use my um, region, render region here to, to try and get a guesstimate of, of, of what samples I need. So I'm guessing I'm going to need at least 30 samples. So let's put 30 samples in the samples area here and it's going to render through. And it's going to take way longer than it did before because it's it's um, these samples are exponential. So I think they're to the power of four. So the, the difference between 10 and, and 30 is, is absolutely huge. It's not just 20 more samples. But you can see that it's, it's still rendering, but it's starting to clean this area up. These bits that are out of focus are getting much cleaner. Um, and that's working well. It's still, so it's finished. It only took 20 seconds for that frame. Um, we've got a, a little bit of noise in there still. So 20, uh, 30 samples isn't quite enough, but it's getting pretty close. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change layout um, one more time. I'm going to go to my Cycles Render Layout. So I've got my render settings docked here. And what we need to do is just make sure we've got everything right for this final render. So um, first of all, let's deselect save. And in the output, we'll just output the current frame because we'll do a bit of a test. And I've got this set at the full resolution of um, it's 1080p. So that's going to render the current frame. Good. And we're not saving anything at this point. So that's all right. So let's go to the Cycles 4D options. And in the device, I've got my device set to CUDA. Um, because I've got um, these two um, Titans in, which uh, render quite quickly on CUDA, so that's going to work well, so I can forget about that. Everything else we can leave default. So then we've got get to the, um, the integrator settings, and what we want to do here is we need to set the samples. Now, in the real-time preview, we had it set to 32 sample, uh, 30 samples, sorry, which was okay, but there was a, still a, a, maybe a fractional bit of noise in there. So let's um we'll keep it at 30 knowing that there's going to be noise but what we're going to do is activate the denoising 
um, feature here. So this this is the denoising options, which kind of it, the denoising works by blurring out um, the areas uh, where there are noise, um, and you can kind of have this affect only certain channels in the render, which is pretty cool. But we'll could just leave all this as default at the moment, and all we're going to be bothered about is is this strength. Now, by default, the strength is 0.5 with a radius of 8. So I'm going to keep that radius as is, but what I'm doing, I just want to reduce this strength way down because I don't want loads of denoising. Um, I'm going to start with maybe just point what. Let's start with 0.2. So we're going to use denoising. We're going to leave the light paths and ray depth settings as they were, because I think they were looking quite good for getting light to uh, bounce around as much as possible, um, as much as we need anyway. So they're all fine as they are. So the only other thing to do before we do this test render is to look at this seed value in the integrator uh, menu. Now this seed value is really important because it dictates whether the noise, any noise that is created is animated frame to frame or is static frame to frame. And this is the rule. If you're not applying the denoising effect, you want your noise to animate because real noise in real life when it's created by recording onto film is animated. It's not static noise. So if you're not using the denoiser, you want your noise to slightly animate because it'll look real. It'll look really weird if you've got this static noise. It'll look like you've got just kind of like a dirty lens. But if you are using the denoiser, you want the noise to be exactly the same on every frame. Otherwise, the blur is going to change from frame to frame and you're going to get this odd blurry flickering. So the way in which you give it a fixed value so it doesn't animate is by giving this seed um, a value of anything above zero. So zero is going to be animated. Any number above zero will give you a, a random noise pattern that doesn't animate on every frame. And that's what you want if you're using denoising. OK, good. So let's try a render to picture viewer then um, with those settings. So I'll hit render to picture viewer here. And let's see. So, I mean, this is a much higher resolution that we had in, in the real time preview window. And we've got the denoising effect happening as well. So my guess is this is going to be, I don't know, it, it, it could be maybe a 50 second render. It could be over a minute. Let's have a look. So it's gradually cleaning up these frames. I think the area where we're going to be able to see whether our denoising and samples has worked are going to be obviously the blurred out areas. And I think specifically in this corner here, we're going to have some very blurred out sections of fluid, which if we're going to see noise, this is where it's going to um, be apparent. OK, so we'll just zoom out to 100%. So here we go. So it, it's not done a bad job. Um, even though it's blurred, it's also looking, there looks like there's blur on top of blur, and that is the denoising effect. But it's done a pretty decent job, I think. Um, so I think I don't think we want any more strength in that denoising. I think that's going to be fine. Um, there is a, a, I'm not sure if you can see it on this capture, but there is a slight little bit of noise in here still. Um, probably we could get away with it. But I tell you what, what we're going to do to try and sort that out is we'll go back to the render settings and we will just increase the samples, let's just boost them up to 32 to give us a few more samples. So this will have a big impact on render times. Let's just go back to the picture viewer. So this one was one minute and six seconds. I would imagine by having these extra samples, we're going to put at least another 15, 20 seconds on that. But I think it's going to give us a better quality render. So I'm happy to start rendering on those settings. So let's go back to our render settings. And in the output tab, we want to, in the frame range, we want to render all frames and everything else can be left as is. Now we want to save this. So I have a file path already saved. You put it where you need to. I'm going to save it as an open EXR file, which is 32 bit. And if you want to render an alpha channel with this, um, this is a two stage processing cycle. So you need to make sure that you do it this way. You need to have this alpha channel section ticked. So that's the first step. But you also must go to the Cycles 4D render settings 
and come down to the film tab and you must have transparent film ticked and this is going to give you your alpha channel um arguably this isn't the best name for this checkbox but this is this is how it comes from the cycles core uh, but transparent film this must be ticked and this will then give you that alpha information okay so everything else is ready to go so then we can start that rendering to the picture viewer and we'll leave it so what i'll do is i'll pause the tutorial here and then i'll come back to you when it's finished and we'll have a look at the final render and i'll tell you how long it took So here's our final render. This took just over, well, it was about five and a half hours to render this, which for kind of liquids with lots of reflec uh, reflections and refractions going on isn't particularly bad for uh, 300 frames. And it's looking pretty good. We've got these really nice areas of uh, defocused water in the real uh, foreground and then in the distance. We've got these nice areas coming into uh, focus. And I really like the way we've managed to get this curvature of the helix angled correctly so it comes round whips and then goes underneath and back up again um, and the the gradient color that we managed to get from the particle information which we then passed on into the cycles 4d material giving it the slower areas this bluer tint and the faster areas a white tint i really like the the look of that not necessarily uh, photo real but um, i think it's an interesting effect it's quite subtle but i think it it brings a lot to it so I think this uh, render, this is just straight out of Cinema 4D. So in post, it could probably benefit from a little bit of post-production motion blur, perhaps to get these uh, uh, in-focus areas just blurring a little with this very fast movement. Uh, but um, I'm pretty pleased with that result. So that is the end of this tutorial. That is rendering our water helix using Cycles 4D. If you've got any questions about this or any of our other official training tutorials, then please join the Insidium Discord channel. This is an online chat room where you can interact with fellow X Particles and Cycles 4D users and with Insidium staff. Also, you can subscribe to the Insidium YouTube channel and then you'll get these brand new tutorials as soon as they're released. So, until next time, I'll see you later. <laughs>